Welcome to the study of God's Word, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Amen. So Genesis chapter 39, in a message that I've titled, Endure Trials flee temptations. And that, that comes, that, that title comes because we all face both trials and temptations. And sometimes, if you've noticed, we even face them at the same time, right? Sometimes it's as if we're down, we're low, we, we've gone through some type of trial, we feel beat up, and that's when temptation comes in. That's when temptation te- seems to sneak in. The opportunity to sin sneaks its way in. And you know, that, that's, not, that's not just by chance, right? Because the Bible tells us that, that the devil, our adversary, seeks, around, seeks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that he's here to kill, steal, and destroy. And so if he could do anything to take our eyes off of the Lord, even as we're going through a trial and we think we're making it through this trial, we think things are going good. And we think, you know, Lord, we're, we're seeking after the Lord. And yet this opportunity to sin comes in. And what do we do? And knowing that we will have both trials and temptations, the question is, is how will we respond to that? Will we make the God honoring decision? Or will we make the man-pleasing decision? Because those are, those are really, no matter which decision we make, no matter what decision we make, they're probably going to fall into one of those two camps, right? They're, we're either going to honor the Lord through our decisions, or we're going to honor and please man through our decisions. And as we'll see here tonight, that choosing the God honoring is the right choice, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be the easiest. Because see, as we, as we go through our study tonight, we're going to see that Joseph had choices to make in the midst of a trial. When temptation came in, even though he made the God honoring choice, which I'm sure would not have been the easiest choice. And if you're familiar with Genesis, you're familiar with chapter 39, you, you would, I'm sure you would agree with me that it wasn't the easiest choice. And it probably at the moment and the things that happened right after that probably made it seem like it it made his life worse. But then if you know the full story of Joseph and you know the full story in Genesis, then you know and you would have to agree with me that in fact it didn't. So as we follow tonight, as we follow along with part of Joseph's story, we get to see how we should respond to both trials and temptations. But first, we want to recap. We want to remember who Joseph is. We want to remember what he's already gone through up to this point. Remember, he, he's the one who had dreams. And he shared his dreams with his brothers. And his brothers basically said, well, how are you going to be above us? And so they come up with this great plot. They, they decide, you know what, let's take him out. Let's kill Joseph. Because then he'll see that he can't be above us. And wisely they decide, you know what, that, that's, that's probably not a good plan. That's probably not what we want to do. But then instead of doing the right thing, instead of repenting, they decide, you know what, let's put him in a pit. And then we'll, we'll tell dad that, that an animal ate him or something. We'll, we'll just put him in a pit. And then opportunity for their sin to get even worse comes as they then make a different decision because they see initial light coming along. And so they say, we could pull him out. So they pull him out of the pit, and they sell him. And Joseph then ends up in Egypt in slavery. And that's where we're going to pick up here tonight in chapter 39. And you know, as we talk about trials, and we talk about how sometimes they, they go along, right? Even what we're seeing in our own country, all of the COVID stuff that we've been dealing with, I mean, we're really... We're really shy of a year of that. And I'm already tired of it, aren't you guys? Yeah. But Joseph's trial, at the point where we pick up, see, he was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. And at the, at the point where we pick up here in, 30, in Genesis 39, he's been in slavery for about 11 years. And so that's, a, that's quite an extended trial. And, and trials tend to wear us out. Trials tend to wear us down, make us weak to where we're easily to give in to those temptations. We see tonight that Joseph doesn't. So pick up with me, if you would, 
in Genesis 39, beginning in chapter 1, says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. Verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph ends up being bought as a slave by, by Potiphar, who Bible scholars suggest as captain of the guard, could have been the head of the guards to Pharaoh. So he would have been like a security detail, probably much, really much like what our um, secret service is now. And given where he's at, Joseph has a choice to make. He has a few choices he could make, right? Some of the choices he could make is he could, as he's there, he could pity himself, feel bad for himself, think of everything that his brothers did to him, which then that, that could lead him to completely rebel against, against Potiphar, against Potiphar's house, everything that, that Potiphar had going. Or he had another choice. He had the choice to honor the Lord. And as we look at our life and as we ponder our life and as we think about things that come up in our life, as we think about trials that could come up in our life, we really have those same choices, don't we? We could go into self-pity. We could maybe even blame others. We could rebel against the situation. We could, we could quote-unquote, buck the system. Or we could honor the Lord. Notice in verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph. You see, his trial, really, as we look at his trial, and and we've already talked about how long he's been in it. We've already talked about what's set up to where he's at now. And his trial is probably worse than anything that many of us here in this room are are watching on the the internet, are listening on Grace FM. It's probably worse than, than what many of us have gone through. Yet we see that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. And isn't that so comforting? Even as we look at trials in our life, that the Lord's with us, that he doesn't leave us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says this. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. He himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. What an awesome promise is that? Such a good promise from the Lord that he won't leave us, that he won't forsake us. So even when we're in the worst trial that that we face, even when the times are the hardest, harder than anything we've dealt with in our life, we're able to stop and realize and notice that the Lord's there with us. I mean, think about it. His his disciples were out on the boat in the storm, right? When Jesus walked on water, his disciples were out on the boat in a storm. And where did Jesus, he didn't wait for him on the other side. No, he went to him in the midst of the storm. Friends, he'll do that for you as well. No matter how bad your trial is, no matter how rough you think it is, no matter how alone you feel, because when we feel like we're alone, we feel desperate. But please, when you get to that point and you feel alone, you feel desperate, please realize that you're not alone because he is there with you. He's in the midst of that storm. He's in the midst of that trial with you. Notice now in verse three, that his master saw that the Lord was with him. And as as, as we ponder that and as we chew on that and as we pray on that, we would have to ask, is that visible in our life? Can others see that the Lord is with us? Friends, can our employers see that the Lord is with us? Can our neighbors see that the Lord is with us? Can our friends see that the Lord is with us? Especially those that we know, those that are around us that are believers, that should be evident in, in our life to them. 
They should be able to look at our life and see that the hand of God is on our life, that the hand of God is in the decisions that we make, that the hand of God is in the actions that we do. And even unbelievers, right? Non-believers should be able to see as we're believers, as we go out and we proclaim the gospel, as we go out and we proclaim what God has done in our life, what Jesus has done for us, even the unbelievers should be able to see. They may not know what it is. They may not be able to label it as the hand of God, but they should be able to see there's at least something different about you. They should be able to, to wonder, what is it that you have that I don't, that makes you who you are, that makes you act how you are, that makes you respond to how, you, to how you're responding. I'm watching you go through this thing. What is it that, that you have that makes you respond in the loving and gentle and caring way that you do? So others, believers and unbelievers alike, should be able to see that the Lord is with us. And in verse 4, we continue. It says, So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. And here in verse 4, we're able to see the choice that Joseph made. We're able to tell clearly the choice that Joseph made, that he served him. That, he, that Joseph didn't focus on what was lacking, but to be put over Potiphar's house, I think we could all agree that he had to be faithful. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been put, o- put over his house, right? Because even an unbeliever would not have put someone unfaithful over his house. I know I sure wouldn't. As a believer, I definitely wouldn't put somebody unfaithful over anything. But even going back to prior to being saved, somebody who was unfaithful and something that, uh, somebody who was untrustworthy to me, I wouldn't trust him with my house, with my possessions. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. And even in the situation that he was in, Joseph was a light in this pagan culture. And the Lord was with him. And the Lord used him where he was. Joseph in this pagan land, in Potiphar's home, as a slave. And the Lord uses him where he's at. And friends, he can use you where you're at. But first, we have to be faithful. Before the Lord could use us, we have to be faithful even in the little things. See, I believe here that the faithfulness that Joseph showed while he's here in Genesis 39, the faithfulness that Joseph showed in Potiphar's house was preparing him for what the Lord was going to do with Joseph in the future. Because I really don't see how, if Joseph was not faithful with this, how he would have been trusted with the, with the more that he's given. Then in verse 6, we have the description of Joseph that sets up the next section. It says, This all that he had was in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread of what he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. This setting up what's going to happen next in verse 7 as it says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cost, lo- cost longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. So now we see the opportunity for sin. Now we see the opportunity because the boss's wife gives the invite. And sometimes, and this invite's pretty direct, isn't it? Joseph, come lie with me. This invite's pretty direct. But you know, sometimes the invite's not as direct. Sometimes the invite sounds a little more innocent. Sometimes the invite could sound like, well, let's grab lunch. Or call me if you need to talk. Here's my number, let's text. Whatever it is, although we see here the, the invite is very direct, but sometimes the invite's not as direct. And Joseph, prior to getting this invite, had already passed the test of prosperity. But now we're going to see, can Joseph pass the test of purity? 
See, Joseph had already proven that he was faithful. Joseph had already proven that everything that, that Potiphar could trust to him, that he would take care of. And Potiphar's home was blessed because of Joseph. But now we go to a completely different area, don't we? We go from material things to sexual things, to fleshly things. And the test we see here, that's jo- the, the test we see here for Joseph, although this is in the sexual realm, but the test really can go further than that. Because you see, sometimes as we have more, we tend to think that, that, we, des- that we deserve more. And it doesn't even have to be in this realm. It doesn't have to be in the realm of finances. It's just as we have more, we tend to think with our logic and our own mind and our flesh that we really deserve more. And if Joseph isn't careful, he, it would be easy for him to say that he deserves this. Because, I mean, he could look at this and he could, and he could say that he deserves this, that he was pulled away from his family. He's been a slave. Nobody cares about him that everything that, that this dude has is because of Joseph, it would be easy for him to justify it in that way. It would be easy for him to say, besides, Potiphar won't know. She's not going to tell. And friends, if we're not careful in our life, we could easily get caught in that snare where we justify our sin where we could say something, I've, I've, taken, I've, I've been in counseling sessions, taken phone calls, where I've actually heard, well, I was being accused of it, so I figured I might as well. Or maybe sometimes we even try to pin it back on the Lord. Well, the Lord brought this person into my life. Well, the Lord must be okay with it, because it's just here in front of me. I wasn't searching for it. We have to be careful when we, when we go down that path because we need to remember where temptation really comes from. You see, the Lord may allow you to be in the season or the trial that you're in, but it's important to realize that the Lord's not the one bringing the temptation. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 reads this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It's when the desire had conceived. See, the desire to sin doesn't come from the Lord. It doesn't come from, from the spirit, right? Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So then that would mean that the desire to sin comes from our own flesh, comes from the weakness of our flesh, comes from our desires. In verse 8, we continue to see Joseph's response. It says, but he refused and, says to, and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in all the house. He has committed all that, is it, that he has to my hand. There was no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I love this. I love how Joseph chose to say no. He refused the opportunity to sin. He had every excuse, every opportunity, but chose not to. Think about it. He's in a pagan land. Nobody's going to hold him to the righteous standard that the Lord would. Nobody's going to say to him, Joseph, you know a holy and righteous God? Potiphar's wife isn't going to tell, isn't going to say anything. I mean, she has, she has, I'm sure being, being in his position, Potiphar probably had it made pretty good. She was probably setting pretty high. She had a lot to lose. It would have been easy for Joseph to say yes. But his response notice left no room to reason with temptation. And if we're not careful, 
we could find ourselves in a situation where we reason with temptation, right? To where we could easily say, well, no one would know. It's just the two of us here. Well, if I go to that website, I could easily delete my cookies. If we're not careful, we find ourselves there. But notice, as Joseph refused, that's what we need to do. We need to refuse before we get there. We need to refuse before we start allowing the thoughts of it's innocent, nobody else will know. It's, it's just between the two of us. We're not married, nobody else, is gonna, nobody else is gonna know about it. We're not hurting anybody else. If we don't put in our mind to refuse before, then we easily start allowing these little thoughts, these little bits of temptation to come in. Notice he says, how can I do this great wickedness? How can I do this great wickedness? He calls it for what it is. And that's what we need to do. We need to define sin for what it is. You see, it's, it's not just a little fling between two people. It's adultery. It's not an innocent website. It's pornography. We need to call sin for what it is because when we call sin for what it is, we see the ugliness that, that it really is. And as we see the ugliness that it really is, then it helps us to remember that we're sinning against a holy and righteous God. Understand this, church, that society does not define for us what is good and what is evil. The only one who can define for us what is good and what is evil is the Lord. Because if we allow society to define that for us, then we're going to give in and we're going to say and that, that things that are not okay, things that are clearly against God's word, we're going to give in to the weakness and we're going to see it's okay. We're going to see that it's okay to kill babies in the womb when we know that God's word clearly says it's not. But our society will tell us that it is. Our society will tell us that it's two consenting adults and who cares what they do? God cares. When we don't define sin as what it is, it tends to make it sound a lot nicer because a fling sounds a lot nicer than adultery. Taking something sounds a lot nicer than theft. And look what he tells her next. He says that he would sin against God. And that's so important that we remember that. That when we sin, even when we think it doesn't affect somebody else, even when we think we're just sinning against ourselves, we're sinning against God. Psalm chapter 51 verses 1 through 4 says this, Have mercy upon me, O God according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge." A side note about this psalm, Psalm 51, is it was written by David. After he, and, and that's, that's kind of funny because he was written after his invite to a married woman. After, opposite of what we see here, uh, a married woman inviting a man, this married man inviting a woman, inviting Bathsheba, and Nathan came to him and busted him on it. So even when we think that no one else has seen, God has. I mean, think about that. If he knows your thoughts, if he knows the hair that's on your head, he knows your sin, and he knows when you sin against him. Joseph knew that even though he was in a pagan land, even though Potiphar's wife isn't going to say anything, even though nobody would bust him. He was held accountable to a holy and righteous God. And I love how John Corson words this. John Corson says this. He says that he, Joseph, had an awareness 
of the Lord's thereness. That as we remember that the Lord is there, we've already talked tonight about how the Lord never leaves us, never forsakes us, how he's in the midst of our trial with us. So then that means that, that even as I enter into sin, he's here, right? He sees, he knows. And if I have that awareness that he's there, how much stronger is that going to make me, be, make me when I battle temptations? And we see here that even if we're strong in the Lord, because I think, I think we, we've been able to see from the text that Joseph is pretty strong in the Lord. And if we see that, and we see here that even if we're strong in the Lord, the temptations will still come. You guys, please, never think that you're above being tempted. Never think that you're so strong that temptation can't come and temptation can't get you. Because temptation will come. I mean, Jesus was tempted. Now we know that, that Jesus didn't give in to that temptation. But he was tempted. And if the devil's willing to tempt Jesus, how prideful would I have to be to think that he wouldn't try to tempt me? So know that, that temptations will come. And sometimes... It's in the midst of that trial when the biggest opportunity to sin will present itself. We see that even with Jesus, right? Jesus had fasted for 40 days. He's in the wilderness. That's where the devil decides he's going to tempt him. And for us, perhaps those temptations come in the, in the middle of a difficulty of our marriage when all of a sudden out of the blue, that old friend that we haven't talked to in, in a long time, and maybe we had a relationship back in the day, all of a sudden, right while we're struggling in our marriage, that's when they call or text or friend us on social media, check in to see how things have been going. Right now, for a lot of us, finances are tight. Some have lost their jobs. Some have had hours cut. And lo and behold, we're a new year. Tax season's right around the corner. How easy would it be for us to claim an extra dependent or, or claim that we gave more than what we did? You see, it's, it's in the midst of these trials that a big opportunity, a big temptation to sin comes. And so maybe as you're looking here tonight, you're looking at the story of Joseph, and you think, well, that's good for Joseph, but, but this, isn't, this isn't an area of sin that I would give into. Even some of the other stuff you've talked about, I don't struggle with. And that's good. Praise the Lord. But understand this. There's more than one Potiphar's wife. In other words, we're all tempted with something. See, what you're tempted with, I may not be tempted with. And what I'm tempted with, you may not be tempted with, right? But you know your temptations. You know what does tempt you. And for us to look at sin in somebody's life or for us to see somebody else who has been tempted with something and say that, that well, there's no way I would give in to that. Praise the Lord, but what would you give in to? In verse 10, continues and says, so it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. So not only did Joseph refuse, but notice here he resisted because this wasn't a one-time temptation, right? It says day by day, day by day, lie with me, Joseph, day by day, lie with me, Joseph, day by day, and yet, he continued to resist. The NLT, the New Living Translation, puts this verse this way. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. So even though the opportunity kept coming back, he didn't flirt with sin. He didn't check it out. He didn't put himself in a compromising situation. 
And we need to be careful not to put ourselves in a compromising situation. Instead of flirting with compromise, we should put things in our life to help us avoid those situations, knowing that they can keep coming back. Because we feel that we, we, we experience the temptation once and we are able to turn from it and we're like, all right, I have victory. And yes, we do. We have victory in the Lord in it. But we don't want to become prideful and think, well, that's it. I'm done with it. Because sometimes it comes back day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour. And we want these things in our life to help, to help protect us from that. We want to be sure that if we're, tempted with, if we're tempted with somebody of the opposite gender, that we're not going out and putting ourselves in a situation where we're alone with them. That if we're tempted with, you know, whatever it may be, that you're allowing things in your life that would block it. That you have somebody in your life that's going to hold you accountable to these things. And so that's why we want to be around other believers, somebody who's going to hold us accountable. Notice next what Joseph did in verse 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. First we see, Joseph refused in verse 8. He resisted in verse 10. And here he ran, even leaving behind his garment. It's better to lose one's cloak than one's character, isn't it? When an opportunity to compromise, we need to remember that jobs, material items, money, all of these things are easier to replace than to rebuild your character. All those things are replaceable, but your character is not. And that is what we need to know, or I'm sorry, that is what we need to do when we're faced with sin. We refuse it, we resist it, and we run. We run away from the sin and we we run to the Lord. That opportunity to sin presents itself. You start, you're struggling with something. Maybe, Maybe you struggle with alcohol and the bottle's calling to you. Rather than run to the bar, run to the Bible. Seek after the things of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 tells us to flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, to be tempted is not sin, but to follow through on the temptation is. We can't control the thoughts that we have. We can't control the temptations that come our way. We can't control when that person calls just at the right time. But what we can control is our response. We can control when we realize we're having that thought that the Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive. We can control when we decide not to answer the phone, not to walk into that bar knowing that we're going to struggle with it. We can't control the temptation, but we can control our response. To turn away from sin may not be the easiest thing to do, but I promise you it's the God-honoring thing to do. And we see that here because, you see, for Joseph, his decision to honor the Lord in this situation was such a big deal that it's recorded in Scripture, that it's recorded for us now here many, many years later as we're studying through this and we're looking at Joseph's life. And we see this, this section here. Verse 13 continues and says, And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. 
And it happened when he heard that I, lift my, that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Verse 17, then she spoke to him with words like this saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. We see here how sin can lead to more sin. Because see, after, after telling Joseph to come lie with her, she had to lie. She had to make up a, a story. Just like David did after his encounter with Bathsheba. Remember, he was busted. Even before he was busted, right? Bathsheba becomes pregnant. He, he calls in Uriah. Uriah refusing to have relations with his own wife because the men are in battle. Uriah being honorable. David basically sets up for him to be murdered. Make, makes it look like it's in the battle. The one thing that we want to remember about sin is it begets more sin. Sin causes more sin. And a lot of times it starts with one little lie and then we're lying to cover up the lie that we told and we're lying to cover up that lie. And we're, next thing we know, we're doing this, this peddling backwards trying to cover up all the lies that we told. To turn away from sin is not always going to be the easiest thing to do. Notice how this sin, that, that point that causes her to, to lie, she starts blaming her husband. And isn't that how we can be sometimes? We try to point blame at others. Sometimes even point the blame at the Lord. We try to tell others, well, it's your fault. You did this to me. If you wouldn't have brought that person here, that wouldn't have happened. But always notice that when we point three fingers, or I'm sorry, when we point, we have three fingers pointing back at us, don't we? Verse 19. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Our sin will always affect others. Even more than what we think. And she probably thought that, right? She probably thought, well, it's just a Hebrew slave. His life doesn't matter. But her husband had the consequence for her sin as well. I'm sure her husband felt betrayed, felt hurt by someone he had trusted. Now, not only does he feel the pain of of the betrayal that, that he thinks Joseph had, but now he also has to find somebody to do the work that Joseph was doing. And we also see here that his home, remember, was blessed because of Joseph. And I can't help but wonder what happened after Joseph was out of his home because it, it doesn't, it doesn't, the text doesn't tell us that. But in verse 21, we do read, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the pr prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there was his doing. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. And we see in Joseph again, even in an expanded trial, he chooses to make the God-honoring choices, showing his character to be one of integrity, making those God-honoring choices again. It's probably why he was able to refuse and to run. But notice we see again that the Lord was with Joseph. So even in a trial that gets longer, even in a trial that gets harder, the Lord was with him. And notice that Joseph was put in charge of the other prisoners. I think we could, we could really say that that would be because 
the Lord honored Joseph's decision. That as Joseph honored the Lord, the Lord honored that decision. And Joseph, I'm sure at this time, could look back and see that this is a time that he stood up and would not sin against the Lord. And even thinking about that, how Joseph would be able to take this time in, in life to take where he stood up to Potiphar's wife and said, no, I'm not going to sin, a whole, sin against a holy and righteous God. You know, this last weekend, our pastor, Pastor Ed, took us through and talked about Ebenezer Stones. And I know that that becomes later, but I think we could see here that, it, that if Joseph would have had an Ebenezer Stone, this would have been one where he would have been able to set up and write on it, this is the time that I stood up for righteousness, that I fled evil, that I fled sin. And friends, know this, that the Lord is with you in your trials, and he sees what you do. But maybe you're thinking here tonight, well, that's nice, but see, I've messed up. I'm not Joseph. I've given in to my Miss Potiphar, whatever, whatever your Miss Potiphar would be. But know this, if that's the case, the Lord's willing to forgive you. Can you turn with me to John chapter 8 as we look and we'll see Jesus' response to a sinful situation. Jesus' response to somebody who gave in to sin. John chapter 8 picking up in verse 1, says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought him to a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Verse 6, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of what to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So first we know that they were testing Jesus because, well, the text tells us. But we also know that according to the law, if they were really wanting to keep the law, both the man and the woman would have been brought to him, not just the woman. So they bring this woman brought caught in adultery to Jesus to see his response. And does Jesus, does he simply say to her, say, let her go and be accused of completely disregarding the law? Or does he say stone her and lose his status as a friend of sinners? In verse seven, we see his response. So they continued asking him. He raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in his midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go, go and sin no more. So notice the one who could have condemned her did not, because we know that only Jesus is sinless. But he didn't tell her, he didn't just point, he didn't just make excuses for her. He didn't just shrug it off. No, he told her to go and sin no more. And this stands for us, that if we've given into our Miss Potiphar, he's willing to forgive us. You see, when you mess up, Allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Allow him to convict you. But know that there is forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that word all literally means all. It's not just some unrighteousness. It's not just everything, but whatever your Miss Potiphar is. It's all unrighteousness. So if you've slipped up, don't buy into the lie that the Lord's done with you because he died on a cross for your sins and he's willing to forgive you. And as a believer, 
He has forgiven you of your sins. But maybe you're in here tonight, or maybe you're listening, maybe you're online, you're listening to Grace FM, and you've never experienced the forgiveness found in Jesus. I want to share with you tonight, friends, that Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He raised the dead. And his payment for it was a beating and a Roman cross. The perfect sacrifice, something that we couldn't be. His bloodshed paying the penalty for my sin and for your sin. And he's willing to freely give that forgiveness to you. The Bible tells us that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so if you've never called upon Jesus tonight and you're like, this is, all this is great, all this forgiveness is great, but I need that forgiveness, you'll have a chance here in a moment. For the rest of us, we need to just continue to look to the Lord and continue to allow him to guide us through our trials and run to him in temptation. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. And Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. Lord, we thank you for giving us examples of somebody like Joseph, who, Lord, was able to refuse, able to resist, and able to run when temptation came in. And Lord, help us to refuse, to resist, and to run. Lord, help us as we go through everyday trials, Lord, as as we go through whatever it is in our life that is troubling us. Lord, remind us that you promised, Lord, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And that's a promise that we could cling to. And if you're here tonight and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you've never accepted this beautiful gift of salvation. You, you, as we talk about sin, as we talk about sinful things, and when we talk about somebody who's with us when we go through a trial, and you, say, and you would say, I need that. I would invite you here tonight to, to stand up and allow me to lead you in a prayer, a prayer acknowledging your need of a Savior. Is there anyone in here tonight who would say, that's me? I need my sins forgiven. I'm tired of giving in to Miss Potiphar. I need, I need my sins forgiven. Is that you? So I invite you to stand up. Standing is not going to save you because it's where your heart's at. But what standing is, is it's, it's an acknowledgement of the change that you need in your life. Anyone here tonight? tell you what, let's, um, if maybe, maybe you didn't respond. If you would like to tonight, after we're done, I'll be up here. Some of the other pastors will be up here and we'll, we would love to walk you through that. But church, let's continue to refuse, resist, and to run to the Lord. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.